from Music City, USA, it's David Hooper and Music Business Radio. Welcome to Music Business Radio. I'm your host, Dan Buckley, sitting in for David Hooper. Today on the program, we'll talk with Sean O'Connell, CEO at Creative Allies and Music Allies. His past includes Director of Promotions at RycoDisc, Marketing Business Development at ETC Music, Radio Promotions at Songlines, and Promotion and Marketing at Righteous Babe Records. Sean, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's great to have you in here, and uh, I'd, I'd love to get started on the program by having you tell us about why you work in the music business and how you got started. Sure. You know, I had a brother that was really into music, and uh, so I remember him buying vinyls and bought cassettes. By the time I became a teenager, I was obsessed with listening to different radio stations. I, I grew up in, in Buffalo, New York, and so we had a great radio station, WBLK. There was heavy metal, there's classic rock, but there was also a radio station called CFNY. And it was an alternative station before there were alternative stations because of the the content laws in Canada where a certain percentage of music on the radio has to be Canadian content. You were hearing bands you couldn't hear anywhere else. So music was huge. I quickly learned that, you know, liking music that girls liked really helped out in that department. And uh, I eventually went to school in a small college in, in Oswego, New York, north of Syracuse. And I got really lucky, and I got really lucky because I had this void. There was nothing going on. There was none of the music I had fallen in love with. I, I felt like I was alone, and there wasn't anybody like me. And I met a professor, and uh, he had worked at FCC, and he had basically said, hey, you know, if you can raise a, a $100,000, you know, you'll be able to get an FCC FM radio station. And... Sometimes when you don't know any better and you're naive, you just go and do it. Yeah, like a hundred grand. What's that? Sure, and um, and almost the day we're recording this is almost twenty years since the day we signed on WNYO. Wow! And it was uh, I went door to door to bars, raised money, put on benefit concerts. So in doing all this stuff, I was actually learning. Arguably learning more than I ever learned in school. I got about halfway there. The student union uh, was able to pass a, a surcharge, like a, basically a tax. And so, you know, one semester was uh, got us the rest of the money. And I never went home for summers again. I literally built studios, you know, helped with the wiring, built CD shelves, you name it. When we were just starting out, we had a we had a radio club on closed circuit, but we didn't have a lot of people for this new station that had this 24-hour responsibility. So, I, you know, I just stayed in this town and ate like crap, you know, had no money, but, you know, had music. And so I did all my radio shows and, you know, we were getting service. And pretty quickly from there, I uh, was speaking at things like CMJ, which is an industry conference in New York on how to start a radio station. I was expanding my network. That same professor had a recording program and um, I was given keys to that. And so I was the only guy in town who could record bands. I was horrible at it. But I still was the only guy in town. <laughs> um, so I, you know, record a lot of records. I, I also put out records. I started managing bands. I was really bored out of my mind. And I started something called The Freak Show, which was a, a sports bar on Wednesday nights that um, was always empty. And they had, the, the way it was laid out, I didn't see a sports bar. I saw like this awesome place to do concerts and have DJs. And so I started something called The Freak Show. And we, from day one, 500 kids, $5 a pop. Most importantly, I got the table by the door and free pitchers of beer. <laughs> <laughs> and me and my posse would sit there. And I remember, you know, just waking up every next morning and I had passed out either counting money or just a big pile of money. And I took what was an incredible amount of money, you know, basically equivalent to like $10,000 a month in college. And just, we would all road trip to see music. I was like, you know, look, we get hotels, we go to New York city, whatever, whatever the, whatever the case was because the town was the, what, the way it was back then. We also had a lot of people with purple hair and green hair. And back then laser discs were a big 
deal and the smooth jazz, new age jazz, I think was the best way to say it. They were sending out a lot of laser discs that had this effect, which we would think of as like screensavers, like a kaleidoscope. And so they would send out an entire laser disc where you kind of watch this trippy stuff. So we'd, all the TVs, the large screen TVs, would just have just obviously just the graphics because we'd be DJing. Um, and that was like, you know, when Nirvana was coming out and came FDM and Ministry and there was so much amazing music that we were spinning. We met a really good friend of mine, Sasha Kiprovarg there, who was a Ukrainian son of a New York City taxi cab driver. So from a kid from suburban Buffalo, that was like, wow. And he, you know, he had the most amazing vinyl collection. So, it, I mean, it all started there. So just in, in wanting to be involved with music, I, I mean, I became this entrepreneur really quickly. I got offered these really cool jobs out of college with apparently what is really good money, but when you're making $10,000 a month, it was completely insulting. <laughs> and I went home to Buffalo and realized that there weren't a lot of jobs in music business offering $120,000 a year. I had to go work on um, uh, repairing stereo equipment, and uh, and I wasn't any good at it. was no horrible at that. So I actually was the guy at the desk taking your stereo and giving it to the repair guy. But I, I just basically started from scratch, and there was a, a club in Buffalo, New York called Nietzsche's, and I wanted to get in there my entire teenage years. It was 21 up. All the bands that mattered started there. You know, the Goo Goo Dolls back in that day, the 10,000 Maniacs, or Ronnie DeFranco, whoever it was. And um, I went and knocked on his door, and he didn't really have any trust that I could do this, and so he told me I had to partner with a local promoter. I did one show with that guy. It was a band I wanted to do. You know, it was my money, but this was a guy who could design an ad, who had connections, who had the trust. And my first show was a band no one's ever heard of in the states called the Wild Strawberries, which were played on CFNY. My promotion was one small advertisement, a ton of flyers handing out in January afternoons with your fingertips would be frozen in Buffalo, New York. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. But, it, it, you know, I every show I did was a sellout, and I just had this touch of knowing, you know, when other people were, were relating to music that I really liked. And um, I think that was a, it's a huge gift. And I quickly went from one venue to three venues. Um, one of the venues was a venue run by uh, NFL quarterback uh, Jim Kelly, the Buffalo Bills. So I kind of, you know, during that whole Super Bowl era was, you know, um, part of that era. And that was a, I had to do marketing for a discotheque. So, so to understand my business, I had a concert business, but I also sold myself as the marketing guy. And very quickly, I was overseeing million-dollar marketing budgets for a small club, Jim Kelly's venue, and a 3,500-seat in the round theater where we would do country acts and Ringo Starr and Chip and Dale shows. I mean, you, you name it. It just was stuff for the first time I didn't necessarily like. But I had to do it, and I learned about selling uh, memberships to these, you know, s theater seasons, which that 3,500 seat, about half of our tickets were actually memberships where people would buy the whole season. So I, I, I just learned a lot. Of, I, you know, did not learn anything about media, media buying in school. I learned about media buying, you know, um, by doing it. Um, it was awesome. It was a, re a really, really fun time. I have to say, the whole time I did that, I... I had a great time. I stayed up late at night, put on house concerts in this loft that I lived in with a bunch of people. I managed bands, ran their record labels. Some I couldn't get signed. Some I was getting signed. And you you have that energy. You're 23, you're 24, and sleep was totally overrated. I was always in a tech, so I'd build the websites at, at a time where them, that was really you know brand new. Yeah. And I, I always say the turning point for me was Ani DeFranco. We should play some on Eddie Franco right now, actually. So, what, what um, would you like to play? Oh man, um, something old school. Yeah, something off of uh, Gravel from Dilate. How, can we play? Can we play the version that uh, she did backstage at Bonnaroo in two thousand four? That'd be great. All right, we're talking today with Sean O'Connell. He's CEO at Creative Allies and Music Allies, based out of Asheville, North Carolina. Later on, we'll talk about why I wanted to play this version recorded backstage at Bonnaroo. This is Ani DeFranco and Gravel on Music Business Radio. <laughs> I heard the sound of your bike as your wheels hit 
hit the gravel, and then your engine in the driveway cutting off. And I pushed through the screen door, and I stood out on the porch, thinking, fight, fight, fight at all costs. But instead, I let you in, just like I've always done, and sat you down and offered you a beer. And across the kitchen table, I fired several rounds, but you were still sitting there when the smoke cleared, and you came crawling back to say that you want. That I abhor you And you were never a good lay And you were never a good friend But I hope, oh, what can I say? I adore you Listening to Music Business Radio. That was Ani DeFranco and the song Gravel, recorded backstage at Bonnaroo in 2004. The first year, Sean O'Connell was a part of the backstage and promotion strategies. Yeah, for Bonnaroo, that's a big part of what we do now. Well, we're going to talk more about that and what Sean O'Connell has been up to lately. After the success of starting his company, Music Allies, he's also CEO at Creative Allies, and they have a lot going on. Stick with us today on Music Business Radio. This is Dan Reed from WXPN in Philadelphia. I am a Music Business Radio podcast groupie. I listen to it every week, and so should you. You're listening to Music Business Radio on the web at musicbusinessradio.com. Old Crow Medicine Show. Don't make a lot of money, baby, that's all right. Because you make a lot of loving on a Mississippi Saturday night. Music City's own Grammy Award-winning musical troubadours, Old Crow Medicine Show. Oh, won't, you won't you tell it to me? Won't you tell it to me? Drink your corn liquor, let the cocaine be. Cocaine, they're going to kill my Saturday, August 3rd, the Woods Amphitheater at Fontanelle. Old Crow Medicine Show with special guest Buddy Miller and friends. They're gonna put me in the slammer if they catch me with that Alabama hot day. Tickets for Old Crow Medicine Show are on sale Friday at 10 a.m. Through all Ticketmaster locations, Ticketmaster.com or charge by phone 1-800-745-3000. Saturday, August 3rd, the Woods Amphitheater at Fontanelle. Old Crow Medicine Show. Rock me, mama, like the wind and the rain. Rock me. Produced by AEG Live. Hi, everybody. I'm Dave Grohl of the Foo Fighters. You're listening to Music Business Radio. You're listening to Music Business Radio. My guest today is Sean O'Connell. He's CEO at Creative Allies and Music Allies and was telling us how he got started in the business. And the big turning point for you is Ani DeFranco. And when you look at your resume, it doesn't talk about all those jobs that you had while you were in college, which totally blew me away. But it starts with Righteous Babe. And that's where Ani has lived for all these years. And, And tell us about working with her. Up until that point, I had been this entrepreneur. I had so many balls in the year, and um, I'm quite a perfectionist. And so at that point, I mean, I was almost looking for, I want to say rest because it wasn't rest, but let someone else, you know, really be in control. And here came this woman who was playing at clubs 
you could just feel it, right? It was kinetic, the energy around her. And it really didn't matter, Sean O'Connell or any of the amazing, wonderful people that were at Righteous Babe. I think her star was rising. To me, to be able to play a role, you know, I needed a, a focus in one thing and at the same time. I think they needed someone to come on and do marketing. First record I was involved with was Living in Clip. And uh, very quickly, Ani went on to um, uh, be on the cover of Spin Magazine twice in one year. I was the first one really to aggressively take Ani to radio, and we had a huge success at multiple formats. And this is a woman who, her and her manager, Scott Fisher, wanted to do it themselves. And I thought it was such an inspiring thing for me was, hey, we don't really care how anybody did it. And this went down to even how we ship CDs. We would strategize about this, and Scott in particular, to like create an entire production line, you know, and overthink it. Um, as independent and spirited as that was, like our filing systems were unbelievable. I mean, just color coded and left justified. And we, you know, were having challenges of how to get the retail marketing in sync with what I was doing with radio marketing and tour marketing and, and all the wonderful things that we, we were doing. So, I, you know, I actually went enrolled in a database class at the University of Buffalo and built an entire custom database from scratch that did all these things, which in many ways, what I learned is the heart of both of my businesses now. If I can give any like technical advice, I think everybody, if they can understand database technology, data is such the underpinning of everything we do. I mean, it really allows you to think about ideas that are in your head, categorize them in a way that can be recycled and, re and repurposed. So it was a really empowering place, um, had incredible success with our strategy. Anytime in this business, you can ride a hit, you know, lots of doors open up for you. And, and at that point, I wasn't looking to, to leave the, the Righteous Bay family, but, you know, I had now been in Buffalo my entire life with the exception of college, and I was ready to, to leave, and the opportunity came with Disc. At Disc, it was, you know, going back to that a very emotional time of being in college radio, those green jewel discs that would show up, the reissues, you know, um, uh, just all the music that came from them was just so important. And the Sugar record that came out when I was in college radio was just like, I still listen to that all the time. God bless Bob Mould. So I got that call. I got to live on the ocean. I, was, I had become a, a huge fisherman. Fly fishing it was was kind of my joy. So I got to literally my work day would be, you know, when it wasn't flying around promoting our artists, which I was on the road all the time. But literally I would get up incredibly early in the morning. I would, with my kayak, walk to the ocean, paddle around, trolling for fish, catch you know, fish in the morning, have a huge exercise, and by eight o'clock still be the first guy at the office. Like it was it was it was paradise. Um so I got to live there, love that, bought my first house, all all that stuff. And Rika was a great opportunity. Um it went through an acquisition when I was there. And I we've got, seen a lot of those lately. We've seen a lot. That was the, that was really the, the the forefront of of a lot of the acquisitions. And this is not ancient history, right? It's going back 14 years ago or so. So I had been asked to stay. I sold the house I loved so much in Boston, paid out ridiculous money to get a place in New York, and then realized before I moved that wow, I didn't want to work for these people. What I bought into was this was a company that was being purchased by Chris Blackwell, you know, the ultimate indie icon, Island Records. But the truth is it was a lot of people who had who had been part of the Universal Records, Polygram, big corporation. And they were good people This that we were an indie label with limited resources and how you market music is so incredibly different when you don't have all those resources, you know, and I had built a really credible, I think, authentic voice in the music industry to promote music that mattered, but I didn't have all the leverages of these megastars behind me. And so I left, um, it gave me like a month and it was all cool. Everybody respected the decision. And I went and did independent radio promotion. I loved the guy I worked for. I hated the job. Um, what I didn't like about it is I, I clearly was a marketing guy who had done radio promotion. You know, and having listed records and just working on ads, to me, all the creativity was gone out of that job. To me, radio was 
way more opportunity than just a song getting played on the radio. It was, we were watching radio stations in front of our eyes really develop an amazing connection with the listeners that went beyond just them listening, you know, or them showing up at an event. Like they were building email lists and the websites were getting really good. And, and how can I reach those core listeners became a really important part of, of how I approach marketing. So I went to a startup uh, called ETC Music back in Boston. And that was another huge turning point for me. I got to work alongside of people who'd never been in the music business. And we were empowered by the company that made the real MP3 players. And they had a huge problem, which is most of the real MP3 players got returned. So if you go back, you know, just over like 12 years ago or so, your MP3 player could hold one album. <laughs> one album. No one had broadband. So if you downloaded music, which would have been from Napster, took forever. You had to load a driver onto your computer. You had to find this thing called the USB port, which usually at that time on your 400-pound desktop, right, there was one. And you just knew they, that wasn't even called the USB port. It was the place to plug your printer into. So you would un, you know, pull the desk out, find this thing, pull the cord out, put your Rio cord in. And so if you think about that process, it's how we enjoy technology and music today. We just acquire it. You know, we just press a button. So back then, literally from getting a device to actually getting an album on, which you you know you had to rip the music off your CD at a really fast speed of two x, you know. Yeah. So it took you thirty five minutes once you'd done all these a uh, driver cord, you know. You, three hours later, you've now got your first album onto your player, and then you're sick of it. <laughs> right? So like, oh my God, I have to do that again. So we were in charge with this idea of, of building these ATM devices that would be all over the world. They'd be at Best Buys, they'd be at airports, and you would jack in your real player, purchase music, or grab the music that you had acquired on the cloud. So it was basically a cloud-based music service over a dozen years ago. I learned a lot from it. Um, I learned how you can blow $3 million in one year. Um, <laughs> it was really amazing. But I, the, I'm really good friends with everybody who's involved. And um, it was a really uh, amazing opportunities. There were a lot of decisions that were made behind the scenes that potentially, the, you know, I think that business could still be alive and flourishing. But probably most importantly for me, beyond the friendships and the learning curve, was I got to, I built up a confidence in myself where I realized I can stay in the music game as long as I want because I had walked into boardrooms at Samsung and Best Buy and wowed them and realized all the skills that I had acquired in the music industry apply to other businesses. Good writing, communication, budgets, you know, presentations, you name it. You know, I mean, all these things that we do have real skills behind them. And so at that point, it was like, well, man, I can jump every time. I'm going to land softly. I, you know, I've got no fear. And I've taken that approach, that kind of entrepreneur approach for the rest of my career, which is I roll the dice. I mean, I think music business is at its most exciting time. Everybody sees, you know, these roads just with carnage everywhere. And I just see roads that are really paved with gold. And so, you know, why not chase those opportunities? That's something you've always done, though. That When you walked into the sports bar that was dead on Wednesday night, you didn't see a dead sports bar. You saw opportunity. You had a vision, and then you executed it. Yeah, totally. It, totally. It, it, and this is, so the, the music space is a great space. You can love music, and you can, you know, be entrepreneurial. Music. Marketing and entrepreneurship are my three loves, and I probably like them equally. I'm not the consummate music nut that just needs to listen all the time because, you know, I'm not creative. I can't write a song. I can't play a note. I can't draw one single thing, but my creative palette is marketing and companies, and so I love it. And that's obviously led to you creating your company, Creative Allies, mm -hmm. and the success you've had in Music Allies. Music Allies brought you to Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, Pretty Girl brought me to Asheville, North Carolina. Um, I was starting Music Allies, and uh, I didn't know if it was going to be New York or Boston, and I had been visiting Asheville and decided, all right, this is the obvious place. Our business has changed. You can live it wherever you want. If I need to be in L.A. or New York, I fly there. You know, our cost of doing business is really reasonable. It's an incredibly inspiring, creative place. So I think that there are advantages to being in Asheville that allow us to see a perspective uh, that I don't think you can see in New York or L.A. I think, you know, the vision of what that business, what, what we think mainstream America 
you know, likes is really sometimes hard to, 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 to grab when your life is so surreal in those cities. Um, I mean, I think that in many ways, I think that's why the national business has been incredibly successful. I don't think it's always about genres. I think that Nashville is this Midwest city where people really, you know, get a sense of what the everyday American likes. And, I, and you know, I, I launched Music Allies to do two things. One, to empower independent musicians who own their own labels and, and give them a long-term solution, basically an uh, outsourced part of their team. So up until then, everybody would just hire individuals for a short term on a project. Well, that worked when we had a hit-driven business and you knew in 10 weeks whether you had a hit or not. And our music business has, has transformed into this very long-haul artist development business. And it sometimes takes years to really see the return. We, we, we live in a world that's so fragmented. You know, we're fragmented across apps, we're fragmented across websites. You know, I grew up in with a handful of radio stations, a couple of music magazines, and MTV. And it was you knew your 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 path to get a large concentration of people to, to love your music was was really obvious. And now everybody's competing against hundreds of thousands of other musicians in a very fragmented media world. So that meant there was a huge opportunity for a company to play that outsource role and have this long term approach. So that was Music Allies. Our mission was to give these independent bands the same opportunities they would get with major labels. And our clients have been really cool. I mean, we've worked with Ani from day one. We've worked with Brushfire Records and their amazing roster. You know, and if you ask our staff, they feel as much part of Brushfire Records staff as they do Music Allies. Every day they go to work, you know, for, for Jack and G and uh, Matt Costa and just a really amazing, um, ma- amazing roster. So we did that from day one. Um, but we also, I was so excited about Bonnaroo from afar. And uh, I just, you know, I had known Ashley Caps and, you know, we got to talking and I felt that the festival business was going to um, be incredibly competitive and clearly they had tapped into something that was very um, similar to what was already happening in Europe for a guy who had had a promote to radio for almost my entire music career and I hated I hated genres and I hated these boxes and I you know I, mean, I, I literally would listen to Earth Wind and Fire and Ozzy Osbourne and The Smiths all in the same hour like I was just, just I just loved music as a teenager and that never changed and the, here was this festival that was, you know, had all these different genres, and it really understood that the average music listener wasn't defined by the magazine or the radio station they listened to. It was they were defined by by a variety of tastes. So we came up with a strategy for that festival and now many others that is about building their brand across um, all kind of media companies. So all these companies I had worked with to market bands, we started working with to market festivals, and. That's an easy thing to do. I think what we do really well at Music Allies in marketing festivals is we partner with dozens of these radio stations, dozens of media companies, print companies, online companies, but we really look at creating value from what that festival's doing. In a way, we look at the pieces, realign them in a puzzle, and come out with something that says, hey, you know, radio. We, we want to do X, Y, Z for you. We want to, you know, we don't just want to send your winners to a festival. We want to give them an opportunity of a lifetime. We want to create content and an atmosphere for your radio station to thrive, to be on site and, 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 and get content and communicate to your listeners in a way that's um, going to be almost impossible for you to do without resources and help. And so we now have about a dozen events that we do um, throughout the year that we in some way handle strategy, marketing, and promotion. It's a pretty cool business. Well, I'd like to talk some more about that. Uh, We need to take a quick break. We're talking with Sean O'Connolly, CEO at Creative Allies and Music Allies, and you're listening to Music Business Radio. This is Mayor Carl Dean, and you're listening to Music Business Radio, your backstage pass to the biz. You're listening to Music Business Radio on the web at musicbusinessradio.com. Dogs. I buckle in my seatbelt and plug my headset in a chair. 
currently touring North America in support of the latest album, Stories Don't End. And I find that the hero in the song that I am writing. The Associated Press calls Stories Don't End a tour de force of cinematic storytelling. Rolling Stone magazine gives Stories Don't End four out of five stars. Available now at Grimey's new and pre-loved music. See Dawes, who American Songwriter Magazine calls your new favorite band. Live in concert as Lightning 100 presents Dawes at Ryman Auditorium, June 9th. But as much as I resist the conversation between the rivers and the freeways, I know it's always there. Stories Don't End, the new album from Dawes. I know it's always there. Available now from Hub Records. Said I think I'm gonna buy. Hey, this is Chris from Augustana, music business graduate. You're listening to Music Business Radio. You're listening to Music Business Radio. My guest today is Sean O'Connell, CEO at Creative Allies and Music Allies based out of Asheville, North Carolina. And we were just talking about how he's been working with festivals like the Bonnaroo Music and Arts Festival. I believe your first year was 2004. And things have uh, come along a long ways since that. Can you take us through the changes you've seen out there? Sure. Um, so what we do um, for festivals that we start really early before tickets go on sale. We come up with a marketing strategy. We identify these partners and we work from pre-launch to launch. And then there's usually a very long window. And while announcing the festival is very important, uh, we have a strategy that, that we kind of call it the hump strategy. So, you know, once all the excitement is over, let's make sure we have a ton of impressions. Um, to give you a perspective, I think that Bonnaroo, we do in excess of two and a half million direct emails just to radio station listeners from our partnerships. So, you know, again, using radio, the on air is a huge part of it, but those direct communications to radio stations to the listeners about tickets being on sale is really, really amazing. Um, so, in, in, in addition to that, part of the strategy is that we, um, from day one, want radio to really understand what Bonnaroo is about. And the thing that's been um, the most successful is this almost village that we, we build. Um, and we build it with a pretty amazing community from Nashville, actually. And it is a 60-foot by 60-foot glassed in tent that um, powers about 40 radio broadcasts throughout the weekend. And we bring in three tour buses where those DJs are able to be right behind the main stages so that they can be up at 6 in the morning, crawl right out after seeing music um, the whole time, and go right on the air. And not only do they have access to be live in the air right there, but, you know, Dan, as you know, because you're part of the secret sauce behind uh, Radio Bonnaroo, is that we build out a recording studio. And that recording studio, it's pretty amazing. Anybody who's in the recording part of the business is that we load in on the hour, every hour, about 40 bands throughout the weekend. And um, so let's say at 9 a.m., you may have Amy Mann loading in. And she may record three setup, record three songs, walk from our Studio A, which is the performance studio, to your world, Dan, your interview studio, never leaving the building. We have a door between the two studios. And she does her interview, and then she comes out one hour later. And then we feed that content to each of our radio partners as a real special perk. And then we also uh, take over a local radio station in Manchester, Tennessee, Fantasy 101, and it becomes Radio Bonnaroo. Um, so anybody who's backstage, who's in the campgrounds, who lives in the area, who's driving in, can hear Bonnaroo from this backstage perspective. It's, it's very, very cool. And we've had just a who's who. You'd probably know even better than I would because you get to talk to all of them. Um, but every year we program the most amazing content, uh, amazing performances. Um, there's something so special about that idea where people there there is no rehearsal there is no everything's multi-track but they don't even know that i think they just think it's going out live over the radio and there's something so special about that live mix we've had bands that we've had headliners who've been playing arenas where they've walked out and said i have not played with my bandmates in a room this small where I could hear their instruments and I could actually hear their voices not coming through monitors. So these really intimate situation um, that we have just creates the most spectacular content. 
And uh, I always tell this when I speak to the students, but my biggest payoff in my business is being able to see the creative process. And so that whole weekend, to be able to duck into our studio and watch that creative process with those bands is incredibly special. You're a fly on the wall. And most people who are music fans will never get to really understand that that's where the magic is. And I don't think anybody, I don't think there's a reality TV show, I don't think anybody's really, really ever been able to package that and communicate that to the average music fan. And I, not only through our festivals, but I've been able to be in musicians' kitchens, be in recording studios, be backstage, you know, my whole career and get to see songs being written, collaborations being done, first takes in the studio and a new riff. It's really, really exciting. But the Radio Bonnaroo is, is it's where it's at. It's um, where I think at this point we're sitting on just hundreds. I, if I'm right, Dan, I think it would take seven days. If you hit play in all the Bonnaroo recordings, it would take you days. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's three or seven, but it would t- literally take you days to listen. And it's pretty exciting, right? So it's kind of this vault that most people have never heard. I'd, I'd love to uh, play one of those. And I also want to remind people, for those of us, see, we li- I live here in Nashville, Tennessee, so I get where Bonnaroo is. And I don't know if people... I think they'll see it being a little bit more magical when they realize this is the middle of nowhere. This is a farm. This is on a over 700 acre farm in the middle of nowhere. And you have this like top notch recording studio. Yeah. It, it, I mean, I guess that's the whole thing with Bonnaroo is when you, you arrive there, I don't, even though you feel like you're maybe in the middle of nowhere, if you'd come a few weeks beforehand, there's nothing there. Um, so it is amazing. And one of the um, biggest obstacles that we had was that we were right on one of the backstage roads. So Bonnaroo is huge, right? So it's like 6,000 employees. And so backstage, I mean, you've got machinery and just so much going on. And before even the music started, you just would hear these huge trucks coming through and it sounded like they were driving right to the recording studio and really, really frustrated. And um, I remember um, I'm Irish and I can get pissed off, as, as you probably know, Dan. And so I took a drive. Sean O'Connell. Sean O'Connell. And I, I co- was just taking a drive to cool down and we saw these guys laying, or, or, you know, doing something with hay, whatever you do in a farm. And it's just I had literally read something at some point in my life about the uh, uh, the benefits of – audio production with hay and the first year hours before we started bonnaroo heat and we just all just got our shirts off just started taking these huge very heavy bales of hay and we just started piling them they just dumped them off we you know pay this this local farmer and so now we actually do it with, with machinery and stuff but uh i just remember we all just didn't realize how itchy hay was but so we the hay bales surround the building we make and we build the building, uh, David Gerke here in town, uh, Elijah Shaw is, is our head engineer, Jesse Newport, Tom Hansen uh, oversees our, our broadcasting, Dan Buckley and doing interviews. So we got this great team, Daniel Fries doing mastering. So all these guys, we build this room that, that's completely surrounded by hay. I can't, how many bales of hay? Hundreds? Oh, at least, yeah. Yeah, maybe yeah. even thousand. I'm not too sure. I, I lost track at this point. Pretty awesome, though. We're talking to Sean O'Connell, CEO of Creative Allies and Music Allies, about his work backstage at Bonnaroo and beyond. Sean, do you have a favorite performance? I I know uh, I could rattle off a few pretty easily. We could take it back to year one, one of the best ones, Gillian Welch and David Rawlings. Yeah, that's it. And again, that that one I think is... That's before we had the hay. Before we had the hay, it was the first year. I was, it was much smaller, and we had a, one of our radio stations going live, and they had just a few minutes to go into live broadcast in New York. WFUV, probably. WFUV, and uh, I think we basically assumed that David and Gillian weren't, weren't showing up. The room was packed of just every musician. I think every, Mo was in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lots of musicians were in there, but Mo was there, and people were sitting on the floor awaiting uh, David and Gillian, and they – Stepped up to the microphone, one microphone, and just leaned in. And I happened to be in the only place, you know, just I just happened to be three feet from them. And I'm sure my breath could be heard. Um, I don't actually think I breathed the whole performance. And it was magical. And they to hear them harmonize, not through a microphone, not through two microphones, but for me, and I think you get in this recording, just how well their voices harmonize. It just through through the air was was beautiful, and there was something about you know something so magical about that performance. So let's hear it. I haven't heard it in a while. It's let's awesome. take a listen. 
This is David Rawlings and Gillian Welch on Music Business Radio, recorded backstage at Bonnaroo, Sean O'Connell's first year there in 2004. This is a new song. It's too new to be named. That was Gillian Welch and David Rawlings, recorded at the Backstage Bonnaroo Studios in 2004. We'll have more with Sean O'Connell when we return on Music Business Radio. You're listening to Music Business Radio on the web at musicbusinessradio.com. The National. With Frightened Rabbit. I'm finding up. Sunday, September 8th at Ryman Auditorium. Tickets on sale this Friday at all Ticketmaster outlets, the Ryman box office, and at Ryman.com. In support of their new album, Trouble Will Find Me, out May 21st, The National, September 8th at Ryman Auditorium. Sponsored by Nissan, proud partner of Ryman Auditorium, produced by AC Entertainment. Hey, 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 hey. 
Hey, I'm John P. Strom. I'm a musician. I used to play in the Lemonheads and the Blake Babies. I'm currently a music business lawyer, and you're listening to Music Business Radio. You're listening to Music Business Radio. Our guest today is Sean O'Connell, CEO of Creative Allies and Music Allies. And we haven't really talked much yet about Creative Allies. And that's something you did a few years ago. Talk about the decision to create another company. So living in North Carolina, I think one of the things that hit me right away was I come back from these pretty fantastic parts of my job out of town. And I always tell people about these. Oh, man, I was you know, with G. Love or with Z. Avi or Ani DeFranco or Amy Mann. And, you know, it's kind of surreal. And, uh, and I don't really gloat about it. I'm not really fascinated by celebrity, I'm, I'm, but I'm so drawn to creativity. And I started meeting all these creative people, usually designers, illustrators, visual people, who would tell me the same story over and over and over. And it would be somewhat something like this, like, oh, man, if you could help me out and get me a design gig, if I could do a poster or an album cover, you have no idea. It would change my life. It would change my career. And when you really dig down past that, it's that most people who go to art school who go to college for art, who are great designers, illustrators, within a few years, majority of them no longer do that for their careers. They may be behind the bar. They may be working in um, pharmaceutical sales. That you know, they may be selling insurance, whatever they're what they're doing, but they're not doing that for their uh, their job. The ones that are find themselves pretty quickly doing a lot of production work, and it's easy. The money's good. You're doing brochures for insurance companies or a restaurant menu or a retail ad and that magic i mean you know we all know the kids who went to art school and none of them thought they were doing brochures and powerpoint presentations right that's not why they they started and so it that really struck me that this business that i was in that most of the creative opportunities went to a few you know, I mean, it was the 1%, 99%. And those few are great and deserving and everything else. But just because you live in Des Moines or you live in Duluth or you live in Columbia, South Carolina or Malta, you should have access to creative opportunities. And so it was just one of those what if moments. What if we really could connect famous musicians uh, and rock stars and open up opportunities for him and uh, Ani DeFranco again I remember talking to her in New York about this and she would say how frustrated it is to look for creative partners sometimes and you know when you think about the typical person who's doing well in the music business I mean their life isn't always as sexy as we think it is they're getting up in the morning usually waking up on a tour bus or in a strange hotel they're doing media interviews for a few hours now at this point it's already one o'clock in the afternoon because they didn't even get the bed to three or four or whatever it may be because they had to wait for a loadout that you know um so they do their line check they do their sound check they eat their meal there isn't a lot of time. They may have gone off to a radio station. Um, so you realize when, when you've got these heavy touring artists that they don't always meet these creative partners. So that was, that was part of it. And so Ani was one of the first investors in, in this business, and uh, we came up with this idea of creative allies, and it works really simple. If you're a designer or illustrator, every day on our site we give you an opportunity to enter a design contest for Bass Nectar or Passion Pit or LMFAO or Ingrid Michelson or the Beastie Boys or Jane's Addiction. It goes on and on. We've worked with hundreds and hundreds of rock stars in music festivals like Lollapalooza and the Warp Tour. From the music business perspective, it's been awesome. They're not only getting access to new art, and they pay a prize for that winning art, um, but they're, we, we, we quickly realized that in a social world, in a viral world, a few hundred pieces of art translates generally into a few hundred thousand impressions. So you can put out a press release, you can put a song out the radio, you can take out advertisements, but when your friend post on his Facebook wall, hey, check out this poster I made for the Black Keys, that is something that goes beyond an advertisement. That is something that really sends a message, right? And it's very personal, and it's a touch point, and you, you hit the like button, you make comments, you spread it around, you're really happy for your friend. And that was great. And so that's where we've been for the last two years, is we've partnered with every major record label, all these rock stars, and we've really become a part of the equation. And it's marketing that pay, it pays for itself. Whatever your prize is, you always own that winning design, and you can monetize that winning design. Now, what's so exciting is we have now built a highly um, capable, 
community of illustrators and designers. I mean, I think probably the best community on the web. And we are now opening that up where anybody can go to bandart.com. And it's a new service where people can actually go to bandart. If you're in a band and you can use our platform, you can run a design contest. You can embed that design contest on your Facebook page. You can embed that design contest on your website. And you can post it on Creative Allies. If you want to post it on Creative Allies and market to our designers, we charge a fee. Otherwise, it's totally self-serve. If you want to give away $1,000 on your site, cool. If you want to give Scooby a few hundred dollars or tickets with grandma, that's okay too. So, you know, we're basically allowing people to use our platform. If you pay for a prize, we just pay that out. So we don't take any cut. In fact, we, we, we actually lose a little bit of money because of the credit card fees and stuff. And that's okay with us. We want bands to be able to use our platform, and they owe us nothing. The bands after the contest can, in a couple clicks of a button, decide that they want to sell it through a Creative Ally storefront. And um, over um, the next few months, we'll be giving them more options. So they'll be able to distribute their art and merchandise on a ton of platforms. And in many ways, giving them as many opportunities for merchandise as they have for MP3s. I think that merchandise hasn't evolved since it started uh, with the Grateful Dead. And our mission is to be part of changing the way merchandise is designed and sold. It's very expensive to order inventory. Bands have to take a big risk, and we're going to give bands the opportunity to sell iPad cases and hoodies and bags and things that they probably wouldn't go out of pocket on because we can do it on demand. We're going to give them opportunities to be in storefronts they never thought about being in. So really, really excited about that. And they can not only sell the winning design, they can sell any of the designs submitted. We're just as excited for our designers. It gives them more opportunities to interact and find new clients. On the designer side, almost every one of our designers who wins a contest gets inundated with calls and new work. So we love that. It's really become a discovery point for emerging designers. And so bandart.com, you can go there and learn all about it. Um, Really, really cool service. Incredibly excited about it. Yeah, well, and we actually used Creative Allies when it was time to get a new design for our van, for the Lightning 100 van. Here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, Sean, uh, I know your time is, uh, is quite valuable. Really appreciate you talking with us today. You've seen this industry change a lot. Mm-hmm. Where's it going? How are you feeling about it? I mean, I think it depends on what perspective you're coming from. I think starting first and foremost from a musician's standpoint, which is why we all get attracted to this business. If you're a musician, I think there's more opportunity than ever before to have a very good career. And I think it's a blue collar career. I think that most of us were raised in an era where what we thought the music business was, was shooting to be this star. Right to really be the breakout musician. The truth is that was easier to do when media was less fragmented, when there were only 20,000 releases coming out a year. There's hundreds of thousands of albums released every year. But the return on investment on recorded music isn't what it was. And that's okay because I think there's more tools, more ways to build a fan base, interact with that fan base. I think Creative Allies is one of many things that can help you offer something of value to your fans. You look at what's happening with Kickstarter and Pledge Music. Clearly, people want to part with cash and support your music. I feel so excited about that. Clearly, people don't just want t-shirts they want their school notebooks to have their favorite bands on it they want their iphones or ipad cases so there's lots of ways for bands to monetize but i think it's just like my job or anybody else's you have to be in a mindset that this is a long term you can't be frustrated because you know the other person got that big hit or that big video play because man, if you can do this and maybe part of doing it is you have a, a couple side bands maybe it's that you're also teaching but you get to do music I and mean, I have lots and lots of friends who are doing amazing that way and part of that means scaling your business and so that is probably the part that feels sad about musicians is you know the truth about Anna Franco is she cared enough about her business to surround herself with people who were great at business and there is such a emphasis on musicians not only to run their business, but to be their social marketing voice, to be Twittering, be Facebooking, spending a lot of time where they used to be creating. 
doing all these other things. And that, and that part I'm sad for, and I don't see an end of that right now, but I think that's um, consequences of the business today. Recorded music, I don't think it will ever come back onto the scale it was. I think that marketing costs have gone down in terms of social tools. I think we're also seeing this incredibly competitive landscape for all the marketing people, publicists, promotion people, where I think it'll be very hard for the, the rates to stay so high because you have so many people who were once employed who are incredibly capable people that can be your advocate. And I think they're good. And look for the ones who aren't looking for you for billing. Look for the ones who really, really believe in you. You know, I think those costs are coming down. So again, if you're in those businesses, it becomes difficult. A lot of the best people who are publicists or radio promotion people or marketing people on behalf of bands usually are really picky, take on very few projects. And if those fees start going down, then they probably have to take on more projects. And so that bothers me because there's some amazing rock star promotion people out there and so I think that part of the business is changing. I think what you're seeing Creative Allies do, I think what you're seeing Topspin go after and, and other companies, I think we're just now looking at the merchandising part of, of the business. And then there's touring, and there's a lot of money there. You have to do it smartly. And touring doesn't have to be always as sexy. I mean, it could be house concerts. There's a lot of ways to do it. It could be opening uh, for, for a band, but then having your band kind of be the house band or whoever the headliner or singer-songwriter is. There's a gazillion ways to do it. So that part's really exciting. I think how fans engage with actual live concerts will somewhat change. You know, I think that there's a, there's a ways to kind of automate those press lists and share photos and experiences there. Um, but live music can't be replicated di digitally. So we've seen that over and over and over. So that part feels really, really healthy. All right. Thanks again to Sean O'Connell for being our guest today on Music Business Radio. Be sure to check out his companies at musicallies.com and creativeallies.com. Thanks for listening to Music Business Radio, a production of Tuned In Broadcasting Incorporated, Nashville, Tennessee. Recorded in the WRLT Lightning 100 Studios. Music Business Radio is produced by Gary Crane, David Hooper, and Dan Buckley. Special technical assistance by Tom Hansen. With Pro Tools post-production by Justin Hamill and Dan Buckley. And Lester drove the bus to lunch. For information on syndication, guest booking, demo derby music, or downloading previous episodes, visit musicbusinessradio.com. Music. Business Radio